<laughs> Thanks very much indeed, and that's, uh, it's great fun to be back. I'm always happy to, uh, uh, to be in this corner of Vermont, uh, and particularly at this, uh, this time of year. I, of course, spoke to you uh, last, uh, uh, early last fall, late last summer, uh, about an issue that I had been uh, deeply and uh, forcefully engaged with, namely the, uh, the troubles of the, of the then new government of Greece. Uh, I have since that time not uh, been back or been back involved with those issues which have turned out very badly. Uh, what I want to talk to you about tonight is something really quite different uh, and much more in the line of uh, the um, scholarly work that I have been engaged with for a very long time. I have had an interest in economic inequality since long before it was a fashionable topic. Uh, back when I was a graduate school in the 1970s uh, down the road, down I-91 in New Haven, uh, <coughs> we were told that studying inequality was a bit like watching the grass grow and it was uh, <coughs> uh, something to be uh, uh, viewed as a low prestige activity. Uh, economists, of course, are highly preoccupied with the prestige of their activities. Uh, <coughs> but I, I developed an instinct for low prestige activities and uh, <coughs> uh, began to take this up really in the early 1980s uh, when uh, uh, I was working for an inspired member of Congress, uh, Henry Royce uh, of Wisconsin, really a wonderful man. Uh, who saw uh, issues developing long before anybody on his staff did uh, and instructed me in 1982 uh, to organize hearings on the problem of economic inequality and rising inequality. Uh, something that was quite difficult to do because there were, in fact, n practically no qualified witnesses uh, who were, could be called. There were a few and we, we, we found them, but they were uh, as you might imagine, low prestige people from low prestige institutions doing interesting work. Uh, and being, uh, that being the case, the hearings got very little attention at that time. Since then, of course, uh, things have changed. Um, since the uh, late 1980s, it's been clear uh, and increasingly obvious that, uh, uh, that uh, the distribution of income in the United States was becoming much more unequal. Uh, and it has become, of course, uh, a central political issue of our time. Uh, my own uh, interest in this, or uh, scholarly work, got uh, a major acceleration, I should say, about 20 years ago, uh, when I was asked by a foundation, the 20th Century Fund at the time, now the Century Foundation, uh, to prepare a study of the uh, economic arguments which were then taking shape on the question of why economic inequality was rising. Uh, and I uh, uh, entered into that um, topic uh, with uh, an open mind, uh, but quickly came to realize uh, that it was not possible to make a useful contribution unless I did some work. Uh, and uh, for that, since professors don't actually work, I needed uh, students. Uh, <laughs> so I, I recruited a few very, uh, uh, very, very talented students, and we thought through how we might uh, expand the uh, available body of information, of data, of the factual foundation for a study of this kind. Uh, and we came up with a way, and we've been pursuing it essentially ever since. And what I want to talk to, not the same students, mind you, they, they do graduate and they move on, but uh, uh, I now think there are maybe five or six cohorts of PhD and master's students that have been engaged in small batches, four or five at a time, uh, and working on this project, uh, which has taken on, if you like, a life of its own, 
and become one of the um, recognized um, centers of research on economic inequality. I mean, it's sometimes mentioned along and reviewed alongside, for example, the World Bank or the World Institute of Development Economics Research and uh, other entities that have been doing this on a much larger scale. Now, admittedly, uh, <coughs> the World Bank is a bigger institution than uh, the group that gathers on Monday mornings at my kitchen table, uh, which consists of four people on a normal day, uh, three at the moment. Uh, <coughs> but uh, notwithstanding, it is the case that we have been able to make a recognized contribution, and I want to describe, uh, I will get around to describing for you uh, what that has um, essentially entailed. What I want to do first, though, uh, is to um, just offer a few cautionary words. Uh, when we speak of economic inequality and when it is raised as a political question, it is almost always done in tones of foreboding and, uh, uh, and uh, urgency uh, that uh, something must be done. Uh, and there is a tendency in at least some circles to uh, uh, place on the opposite pole of full equality uh, as the uh, ideal objective. Um, and of course, once one thinks about this with any care or dispassion, you realize that that it cannot be the case, is not the case, uh, that there is not and never has been and never will be a successful human society which tries to equalize everything, that the uh, nature of the way we organize our lives is rooted in a legitimate inequality that we uh, uh, reward some people more than others. Uh, we structure uh, uh, market competition so that people are constantly seeking to outdo each other uh, and we uh, uh, allocate prestige uh, in economic terms substantially according to the extent to which they manage to achieve that. We build organizations with hierarchical structure, uh, and uh, we regard that as perfectly normal. Uh, and in the society as a whole, we also um, accept that uh, a, uh, an economic uh, uh, system which has a degree of desirable dynamism is going to generate a small number of enormously big prizes right, for people who are uh, companies that uh, manage to uh, lead the world in new technical directions, uh, uh, whether that's in electronics or in, bio, uh, uh, in, in biological sciences or in communication networks or in energy and other things. Are, are going to become uh, uh, quite successful, and the people who lead them are going to become very rich. Uh, and we accept that uh, in this kind of lottery, there will be a lot of people who will be drawn in by the prospect of those prizes, but only a very small number will actually achieve them, and so that there will be a vast inequality, at least in that sector of economic activity. So all of this is part of what we uh, take as entire, entirely for granted, uh, and uh, we have to accept and deal with that as we think about uh, what should be done. And it's also the case that uh, we use national frontiers as a device for uh, establishing and perpetuating forms of inequality. It's entirely the case that we consider we have responsibility, uh, much stronger responsibility to the people who live within our national frontier, and particularly those who are legally uh, accepted within those frontiers, than we do to people who live outside. That's the way nation states are organized, uh, and the hierarchy of income and wealth across the world is a very profound one, which is rooted in that, in that basic fact. So uh, it is not, would not be reasonable uh, to take a position of, let's say, uh, unqualified egalitarianism, the question is not whether we should have inequality. The question is how much. The question is a question of degree. It's a question of 
whether and to, and to what extent we should place limits on uh, the kinds of inequ the inequality and the degrees of inequality that we experience. Now, as to types of inequality, I want to say a few words about a type that is uh, very important to sociologists in particular and very important uh, in uh, thinking about social organization. And this is called categorical inequalities. Uh, categorical inequalities are those that depend upon one's membership or assignment uh, to particular groups that may be favored or disfavored. And there are forms of categorical inequality that we accept as entirely normal and indeed around which we organized uh, the uh, uh, functioning of, uh, of, of, of the world in which we live. Uh, for example, we accept that uh, certain uh, degrees from certain uh, institutions are more valuable than others. We accept that certain forms of certification are more valuable than others and provide a, a reason to exclude some people from the practice of certain lines of work. Uh, we accept more generally that the year, one's years uh, spent in schooling uh, count uh, for, toward one's uh, economic prospects. So this is entirely, as I say, anybody who argues against that is going to be arguing against a very uh, widely accepted viewpoint. At the same time, uh, of course, there are forms of categorical inequality that we do not accept. Uh, and against which, even though they are deeply rooted in the kind of society that we have evolved from, uh, that we consider to be wholly Ill illegitimate. Uh, categorical inequalities based on race, based on gender, based on religion, based on national origin, are those that we have uh, set out to uh, reduce, if not to eliminate. So we have a body of values that are structured around those questions. Uh, but that's not the issue that I want to address today. Um, what I want to talk about today has to do not so much with uh, these questions of how individual groups are assigned to their position in uh, a social ordering, but with the structure of that ordering itself. Um, and here we, uh, we have, if you think about, um, even if you think about how one might approach dealing with unacceptable categorical inequalities, uh, there are um, two ways, essentially, of proceeding. One is to accept the existing structure of distribution and to strive to distribute the members of all of these groups more or less equally across that structure so that there are no perceptible differences across the group averages, but still very large differences uh, from one individual to another. That's the approach that we take uh, when we implement, for example, affirmative action programs in, uh, uh, in uh, university admissions or in uh, uh, professional advancement. We're basically saying, well, we've got a given structure of incomes and wealth, but we do not want that structure uh, to operate to the disadvantage of any particular predefined population group. That's uh, one way to approach the question, and that's a way which essentially leaves uh, the structure itself untouched. And the other way is to ask the question, is the structure itself something that we wish to um, investigate and <coughs> possibly change? Uh, and doing that does not necessarily uh, address the problem of categorical inequality. You can still have some groups which would be at the bottom and others that would be predominantly at the top. Uh, and uh, the difference would be that the gap between them would be reduced by the extent to which one has made the overall structure more egalitarian than it was before. Uh, and in order to address that issue, which is the one that I have uh, uh, you know, my greatest interest in, uh, it's necessary to build up a body of knowledge about uh, different economic structures uh, and to 
make uh, essentially a um, reasonable comparative analysis of uh, across countries and through time of what uh, uh, the human experience is and to try to assess whether there are advantages to having a more egalitarian structure than any given country might have. And that's, I think, an issue of very considerable importance, but it does require that one have a reasonably reliable view of the facts. Otherwise, uh, one is simply uh, creating and spinning hypotheses out of thin air. All right. The question then is, well, what facts are we going to inquire after? What are we going to try uh, to investigate? Um, there are, of course, many things, many aspects of uh, human societies that one could, in principle, be interested in. I suppose the distribution of happiness uh, would be one of them. Um, distribution of health would be another. Uh, the distribution of culture might be a third. Uh, but you're not going to find many economists getting deeply into the weeds on these topics, at least as an empirical matter, uh, because there are not records that one can investigate that are reliable over long periods of time and across many countries on this subject. So economists being prosaic and to some extent practical people, well, some of us are, uh, <coughs> uh, tend to focus our attention on things that can be measured, even though they may not be the most interesting or important things. And there, there are a couple of basic uh, <coughs> points of focus, if you like. Uh, one of them is the reward to work, which we'll call pay, or earnings, wages and salaries a very prosaic thing, uh, but one which covers the economic lives of uh, a substantial majority of people in almost any society you can examine. And looking at it has a great advantage uh, that uh, you can, in fact, find information uh, that you can inquire into. The other uh, economically important uh, aspect of um, of the distribution of uh, economic well-being uh, is, of course, the distribution of property, and therefore of wealth. Wealth, which can be defined narrowly as financial assets or broadly as anything that can be turned into a financial asset or might be considered equivalent to a financial asset. And those definitions are uh, extraordinarily flexible and elastic. You have to be quite careful. Uh, about what exactly you're talking about when you use the word wealth or property. Um, but uh, it's clear that for a substantial body of the population, particularly in a wealthy country, uh, property is a very significant source of income. And the concept of income, which is the easiest thing that economists try to measure, is actually a mixture of these two uh, concepts. For most people, it's predominantly labor income, but, but for a significant fraction, and for those especially at the top, it's substantially or even predominantly property income. And income is what one measures, particularly if one has access to tax records, uh, because the, uh, then one has a taxing authority that tells you how to account your income. And then you do so according to the rules and file tax returns, which are then available uh, for, uh, um, for study. I'm going to focus on pay and earnings inequality. Uh, that part of income which is primarily related to work and to work time. Um, because it is a uh, dimension which is broadly measurable across a large number of countries over the period, the modern period, which is basically since the early 1960s, 
Before that, you didn't have a large number of countries, by the way, so this is <coughs> the reason why you have international statistics is that the empires broke up in the late 50s, early 60s. And a great many countries were created, which then, who then started to collect uh, 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 data on their activities. Um, and it's then possible uh, to say a few things about how uh, countries can be compared at the global level. Uh, there are basically three uh, types of information uh, that are available for this purpose. Economists have historically and still predominantly focused on one type, which is um, surveys. Basically the effort of going out and uh, taking a sample of uh, households usually uh, and uh, getting them to report uh, their income according to some definition given by the survey taker. Surveys are a very valuable technique. A great many of them have been taken over the years. Uh, but they, as a tool of international comparison, they're terribly problematic. Uh, and the problems arise for a number of reasons. Uh, the most basic one being that surveys are expensive. And in many countries, over many years, they simply are not available at all. There's no data. And there is no way to go back and construct what a survey would tell you if you didn't take one at the time. I can't go back to you, sir, and say, could you tell me your family income in 1975? You might have a record of it, but most households would not, and many households uh, that were in existence in 1975 are not existing anymore today. So we would not be able to reconstruct that record if it didn't have a contemporaneous uh, 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 collection of the information. And that, over the, post, the period since 1960, contemporaneous collection is more the exception than the rule. There are some countries, the United States obviously, but countries of Western Europe, Japan, India to some extent, which have uh, pretty good survey taking uh, over the years, but many countries do not. <clears throat> Uh, the second problem is that surveys uh, are uh, idiosyncratic about what actually they inquire into. Uh, most countries are interested in income, and most countries, the survey takers, are in interested in income. But in a significant fraction, they're interested uh, primarily in consumption, okay, expenditure. And expenditure and income are two very different things. And the inequality of income and the inequality of consumption expenditure are two very different measures, uh, which are not easily brought into alignment with each other. Uh, and so if you are not careful about what it is that you are, uh, what, what the data you are looking at attempt to measure, uh, you are going to run into problems. And within income, there are a number of different classes of income, of which the broadest three are income given by the market, uh, gross income, which includes what's what governments uh, pay out as transfers, pensions, for example, and net income, which takes away what uh, uh, the governments reclaim in taxes and provides with disposable income or living standard. Those three also are very different in terms of what uh, they uh, purport and actually measure. Um, it's also the case that in many countries, uh, even if you have a, 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 a national survey, Individual researchers looking at that survey come up with widely different results. I could show you graphs from Mexico, for example, where everybody draws on the same uh, survey, but everybody gets a different answer. I don't know why. Uh, it's just a problem of inconsistent research methods, or not research methods that differ across, um, uh, across uh, researchers. So that's one source of information. The second source of information that's become very fashionable in recent years is tax records. Tax records are uh, the um, uh, data resource that's been particularly advocated by, uh, by Monsieur Piketty. Uh, and uh, they are very valuable, uh, in particular insofar as they give quite a lot more insight into the incomes of the very richest people uh, than, uh, than surveys are going to do because they uh, obviously it's the, in, a, in a country with a well-run tax system, uh, the wealthy are reporting their, their income. Uh, and so the tax authorities have a record of it. But tax data are also 
quite limited. Uh, one major problem is that there are a gr very small set of countries, 29 in the most recent version of Piketty's data that I'm aware of, uh, that have income tax records available to researchers. And if you don't have income tax records, you don't have tax data. Simple as that. So there's no tax data on the Emirates, for example, or on Saudi Arabia or on many countries where there's no income tax. Simple. Yet it is, I think, the case that there are wealthy people in that part of the world. I don't know if your experience with that would cons is consistent with that view, but at least that's my impression. I, I flew into Dubai the other day. It didn't look like a dusty, impoverished town to me. Uh, okay. Uh, that's one problem with tax records, and another problem with them is that uh, since the tax authorities define what your income is, uh, when they change the definition, uh, then you have to report a different number. And so doing tax records properly requires one to track very carefully what the major changes in the, uh, uh, in the tax laws are. Uh, this is a problem I ran into uh, with uh, Piketty's data, for example, uh, because it shows a, a, an enormous jump in the inequality or in the share of the top incomes in 1986-87. In 1986-87, and there are people in this audience who I, I'm sure are old enough to remember uh, those years, except they're hard to remember because nothing much happened. There was no great recession, there was no financial crisis, there was no war, there was nothing that would generate a uh, massive increase in inequality. What there was was a big, big change in the tax law, something I know about because I was involved in writing that tax law, the Tax Reform Act of 1986 which had the effect of causing people who with high incomes to reduce the deductions that they could legally take and to report that as adjusted gross income, uh, which was then taxed at a lower rate. But it's the adjusted gross income which shows up in the inequality records. Uh, and that jump is a pure artifact of the tax reporting, not of any change in the underlying society. So one has to be very careful. Otherwise, one comes, gets into all kinds of difficulties uh, with this way of looking at things. Is there any other way of doing it? The answer was the answer that we came up with, which is yes, there is a, an interesting alternative possibility. And that is to use very simply the administrative records that practically every functioning government collects on a routine basis. Uh, the most common forms of administrative records are geographic records. Governments estimate the number of people who live in each geographic unit uh, and what their total incomes are. Uh, and industrial records. Governments like to get information on manufacturing establishments, particularly how many people are working in them and what the total payrolls are. And those are accounting numbers which are reasonably straightforward and reasonably accurately collected all across the world. Now that's only a part of the income distribution. It's only a part of the pay structure. It doesn't include Oh, the gray economy, it doesn't include uh, uh, high-end services, it doesn't include bankers, it doesn't include uh, peasant agriculture. Sorry. But it turns out, and we can assess this by statistical means, which we have done, that a measure of inequality done in a very simple way across that kind of category uh, from that kind of data set is a very reliable indicator of what's going on in the larger population. So it picks out what you want to know in two respects. One is what's happening through time. And the other, which surprised us, astonished me really, because I couldn't work out why it would be the case, but it is the case. It also tells you pretty reliably how to rank countries from low to high inequality measures. Uh, and so with that uh, insight, um, basically, uh, a departure from the economist's preoccupation with sample surveys and to use, uh, as I say, administrative records instead, which are available published tables. All you have to do is get the paper and copy it down. I have been employing small groups of students for decades uh, to do exactly this kind of work and make the calculation on a spreadsheet as to what the inequality measure should be. Uh, <coughs> there are, mercifully, uh, some international data sets which do a lot of the work of systematization for us 
uh, and which we're able to take advantage of. Uh, one of them, uh, for example, in Europe, there's a, a European statistical agency, Eurostat, produces a regional data set, which is very helpful. Uh, the OECD produces something called the structural analysis data set, which is very helpful, was at a particular moment. Um, the um, ECLAC in Latin America has its data sources for that region. Uh, but the one that we found particularly helpful to do work at the scale of the world economy uh, was produced by the United Nations International Development Organization, UNIDO, the industrial statistics. A very mundane data source. Uh, I don't know what other people use it for. I've seen some references to it and general acceptance that it's of high quality. Uh, but uh, aside from our work with it, I don't think I've seen a lot of original economic research that's been based on it. But it turns out that that data set did provide us with a very broad coverage of the world economy going back to 1963, uh, and which now gives us about 150 countries compared to, say, 29 in Piketty's data set, uh, oh, and about 4,000 annual country year observations, so separate measurements, um, which are all calculated. One, the, re, the most recalc recent recalculation was by uh, a graduate student who came to me from Tehran, actually, which is a uh, very, very talented fellow. Uh, in any event. My coffee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So what I want to do now is uh, just walk you through a little bit of some of the basic things that we find. Um, and this is done um, by uh, the, the complicated issue here is uh, the challenging issue is how to present this very large amount of information in a way in which uh, it's easy to uh, assess what the basic uh, relationships are, what the basic patterns are. Uh, and of course, maps are a very useful way to do that. They have some limitations. Uh, but what we've done with a mapping scheme is to apply a consistent color uh, framework where we use uh, dark to light blue for the lowest inequality measures uh, and uh, yellow to orange to red for the high inequality measures. And I average across decades to get enough coverage uh, based on the data that we have, uh, and uh, I'll show it to you decade by decade. But even from this map, which is for the 1960s, uh, and you can see there are limitations to the coverage, but still it gives you a pretty good idea, you can see one fact very clearly, which is that rich countries are more egalitarian than poor countries. Very straightforward. Now, why is that? Well, the basic reason for it is you cannot be a rich country unless you have a substantial middle class. A substantial middle class which will typically be an industrial working class, an industrial and urban working class. In poor countries, what you will see, largely, uh, is a dual economy with mining and agriculture. Right? And uh, some wealthy people maybe some very wealthy people, some people wealthier than you will find in the rich countries. Uh, but they won't have their wealth in the poor country, by and large. Uh, but most of the country will be poor. And those countries, the inequality measures, are substantially higher all the way through uh, than they are for the wealthy countries. So that's the first uh, sort of basic Excuse fact. Me, what do the numbers mean? Uh, these are Gini coefficients. and Pardon? These are Gini coefficients, and they are... Uh, calculated off of something called the Lorenz curve. Uh, it's a very, it's the most uh, widely accepted uh, way of providing a comparable metric of, of economic inequality. So this is, uh, these are uh, Gini coefficients, and I, I won't get into the technical details, but we used a model to convert our direct inequality measures for industrial pay into what we think uh, would be an appropriate estimate of a particular form of household income inequality, which is gross household income inequality. Uh, and we've since done uh, an enormous amount of checking against the published literature, and we discovered our model is really very good. It really works very well. It underestimates for some countries, um, and, but in general it is uh, very close to the survey data that's available, but we cover a great many more years and we cover a great many countries that are not for which surveys are very, very sparse. 
um, for example, there's only one year uh, of, of, of a comparable survey for India where we can have 30 years, years or so of data uh, of, on this concept. And that one year of comparable data is very close to our measure. So in any event, we find uh, very reassuring that uh, having sort of cooked up this little model, it is consistent with what uh, the larger body of research shows. But the beauty of what we do is that we have enough density of coverage to be able to give you some sense of what's going on in the world economy as a whole. Uh, and you can go through these decades uh, and you'll see that what happens is that things change. This is into the 1990s and we get coverage of course for the former Soviet Union and uh, for uh, Eastern Europe after the collapse of communism uh, and into the 2000s. Uh, and in the 2000s there are only a handful of countries that have inequality levels in our data that were commonplace in the 1960s and those are the Scandinavian countries. Inequality has risen everywhere uh, by substantial amounts um, and uh, that is a second basic fact. I want to say that uh, I should say just by uh, parenthetically or maybe not so parenthetically when you look at our measure for the United States it is low relative to what uh, income surveys will find and the reason for that is that we don't take account of property income and property income in the United States is very important in measuring inequality is extremely important. Uh, so when you add that in actually earnings inequality in the United States is not all that high but it's the property income that generates the rise of inequality that we've observed and it is in particular uh, the rise in the price of capital assets that can explain statistically very well what has happened to overall income inequality in the United States. People who own capital assets, particularly the shares of Microsoft, uh, have uh, experienced some very substantial increases in their income as the shares of those companies have gone up uh, over the, um, uh, as they, particularly as they went up in the late 1990s. In the 2000s, some other factors were also very important. Uh, but uh, the, nevertheless, it's, I think it's fair to say that our measure is consistent with, for the United States with other countries simply because in other countries we don't have good records of property income. It's actually quite rare that, to have that uh, and that we have it because the Internal Revenue Service is quite effective in getting people to report uh, whereas if you're in Germany, uh, for example, the property income tends to be much more in privately held companies so that these gains are not necessarily reported as taxable income uh, in other countries and of course in every uh, country uh, there's a tendency for the wealthiest to uh, to uh, call up their friends at, at, at uh, what was it called uh, Mossack Fonseca uh, the, uh, uh, the Panamanian law firm uh, and uh, uh, and assure that their property income is not, re is not recorded. So uh, in that sense, this is consistent with uh, uh, what, uh, for the U.S. with the rest of the world. Excuse me. Yeah. The white countries in Africa, why are they white? Uh, because I don't have data. Okay. And the reason I don't have data is that they are, um, at least I don't have data for the 2000s. I saw, in some of them, Nigeria, for example, we do have data. Uh, but it, it's not necessarily updated to the point where, yet where we have a 2000 record. Um, and, uh, but in, in, in the Sahel countries, for example, where there's essentially so little industry, uh, we, we don't have a good basis in our data set for coming up with an estimate. Right? So there are, uh, I mean, there, there are weaknesses with this, but you are looking at an overwhelming uh, percentage, by far the broadest percentage of the world economy covered in a single consistent data set for, uh, for economic inequality. Okay. Okay. Now I want to show you a second set of maps and this changes things a little bit um, but enables us to see a little more clearly uh, what uh, uh, the patterns of movement have been. The previous maps just showed you levels and gave you a kind of comparison of the low inequality and high inequality countries in a general sense of the trend. Uh, what these do is to 
look at rates of change over six-year intervals, which I've selected here for the ones that are most dramatic. Uh, and I'm using the industrial pay inequality measures directly here because it's a little richer in terms of coverage. Um, and what this, uh, the, the color scheme now is uh, blue indicates declining inequality and the yellow to orange to red is increasing. So rather than levels, we've now got patterns of change. So if you can make that mental adjustment as you look at the maps, you'll see what was going on in the mid-1960s in our data. Uh, there's a mixed picture. There are some countries where inequality is increasing, some where it's uh, declining. Uh, but over, and there isn't a consistent world pattern. Okay. Uh, obviously, there are some limitations to the, uh, uh, to, the, to the data coverage that far back. But uh, we go through, and let's see, what do we got here? Uh, this is 1966, 1970, into the 1970s. Um, in the 1970s, it's quite interesting. This is in the period of the oil shocks. Um, you have, um, well, a pattern where the inequality is rising most rapidly in the consuming countries of the world. Um, and you go into the 1980s, things start changing dramatically. So there's a real turning point, and this will show up if I gave you a, 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 a line graph of the averages. Uh, a real turning point in the 1980s. You can see the color shift in Latin America. You can see it beginning all across Europe and including the Soviet Union, for which we do have no data. data for the US. I don't know why I don't have data for the US there. It's something I have to look at. Uh, I'm quite sure, though, that the US numbers should be going up. That's, that's a, a little gap in the mapping, I think, because I know we have. I know we have the annual data for the U.S., so it should be there. Um, okay, so what's happening here? A major transition toward rising inequality, and as it goes, as time goes on into the late 1980s and 1990s, this is 1990 to 1996, the increase in inequality continues, but the most extreme version of it is in the former Soviet Union and uh, Eastern Europe. No surprise there. No surprise there. Uh, that goes on up until 2000. And into the 2000s, things begin to change once again. This is 1997 to 2003. 2003 to 2008. I think that's the end of it. Yeah. Um, let me go back up. So. What one can see from this is that there is a pattern of movement through time. Right? And there is a turning point in 1980 and another one in 2000, roughly. Right? The turning point in 1980, actually there's a turning point in 19, around 1971 as well. Uh, between 1971 and 1980, a large number of countries showed declining inequality. 1980 to 2000, we have this pattern of rising inequality all across the world, peaks out in 2000. Excuse me. Yeah. I just want to clarify, this is just pay inequality. This is just pay inequality, but it's a very good indicator for in income inequality. So it would not be terribly different. It's just that the pay inequality measures are more sensitive, so you can pick out turning points more clearly. What's going on in the data? I would suggest that the fact that there are common patterns of movement across regions with particular turning points tells you a lot about what is driving this. And what is, appears to be driving it, I think very persuasively, are global financial forces. Beginning in 1971, one had the breakdown of the stabilizing framework that had been built in 1945 at Bretton Woods the Bretton Woods system. After 1971, there was a period, lasted for about nine years, of strong economic growth and development funded by credit, the recycling of petrodollars, and commodity, high commodity prices in the developing world. Those countries that were able to take advantage of that tended to have falling inequality. In 1980, that world came to an end with the onset of the global debt crisis. Interest rates raised in the United States to 20% produced economic collapse 
throughout Latin America, Africa, much of South, Southeastern Asia. Okay. And that shows up violently in the data as an increase in the internal inequality of all of these, most of these countries. And it's quite remarkable, actually, if you look at the, at the, at the pictures for individual countries at the, at, the, at the data, how you can pinpoint the political changes and the consequent increases of inequality, political changes that are associated with the stresses of, um, of, of the debt crisis. There is a sequence here. Now, obviously, it affects, affects Latin America first, it, but the uh, collapse of the, of, of the communist regimes in Eastern Europe and of the Soviet Union, which is part not unrelated to the same global financial forces, uh, brings that uh, phenomenon home to those regions which had previously been insulated. And then in the late 1990s, uh, you see it in China. So as, you, as countries become exposed, and after 1992, actually also in India, which liberalized in that year. So as countries become increasingly exposed to a very unstable global financial market, uh, you can see our environment, you can see the rise of inequality, and you can also see that it peaks, and that, in fact, it is not an, a fundamental or irreversible force of the capitalist system, uh, but rather one which at least stabilized, although at higher levels, in much of the world after 2000. And one thing that's going on, and it's clearly going on in Latin America, but it's also going on in Russia, and clearly going on in China, is a retreat from the commitment that those uh, uh, countries had to a certain form of uh, financial openness, the neoliberal model, the Washington consensus, uh, the idea of uh, uh, the, the dominance of the free market ideologies, which became uh, the uh, sort of global uh, uh, prescription for all countries in the 1980s. But by the 2000s, countries were in a position, many countries were in a position uh, to uh, back off uh, from that ideology, and they uh, acted on that disposition. Uh, they were aided, of course, by uh, the reduction of interest rates in the United States following the 9-11 attacks and following the collapse of the information technology boom, uh, and by uh, the uh, rise in commodity prices, which was uh, largely driven by demand from China, uh, and strong effects on Latin America as well. So one other thing that we tried to do, and I want to show you next, uh, is to see if one could substantiate this argument by finding an economic variable that would be uh, associated closely with movements of our measure of economic inequality. And that's not so easy to do because there are not many uh, statistical variables, not many records, that one has, uh, for which one has the coverage that we have for inequality. But there are some. Uh, and one of my students last year, uh, a young woman named Delfino Rossi uh, from Argentina, had the idea uh, that she should look at exchange rates. And in particular, each country's exchange rate against the dollar, against the world anchor currency. Uh, and the idea which, uh, I found theoretically very appealing is that uh, it's very simple that when a country which uh, uh, particularly in the developing world but also in many developed countries uh, basically they're in, any country has industries which either sell to the interior or sell abroad and industries which sell abroad earn a foreign currency if their na national currency depreciates the um, amount of local currency that they earn goes up next day. And if those exporting industries tend to be better paid, the inequality is going to go up. It's a mechanical process. Uh, and the question then is, does this show up in the data? Well, it's easy to uh, investigate this just by plotting uh, a, a scatter plot of exchange rate uh, and inequality. Uh, and I've just done this by uh, in alphabetical order, but you can uh, run, through, run through the cases. There's Australia, there's Bangladesh, there's Brazil, 
there's Cameroon, and there's Canada, there's China, there's the Czech Republic, there's Hungary, there's India, there's Ireland, there's Mexico, there's Peru. You see, every single case, the line slopes upward. Every single one. Right? There's Romania, there's Senegal, there's Singapore, the Netherlands, Tunisia, Turkey. In some cases, the slope is bigger. In some cases, it's, it's, it's a bit more shallow, but it's upward sloping practically everywhere. Is there an exception? Well, scholarly honestly does uh, oblige me to uh, uh, admit that we did find one exception, and that's Italy, um, which, uh, of course, is not trading with the U.S. It's largely trading with, the, uh, Europe, with its European partners, so that may be a... Uh, that may be a... Um, uh, is this the exchange rate to the dollar? The exchange rate to the dollar, yes. Yeah, so uh, it, I, we might find the right relationship if we did it to the Deutschmark, right? But, uh, but I'm more, or the Swiss franc, yes, possibly. But I'm, I'm, I'm inclined to dismiss Italy by reminding this audience, and I know many people are old enough to remember exactly what it was that Richard Nixon said about the lira. I can't repeat it if we're going on television. <laughs> he said, I don't give up about the lira. In any event. Uh, nevertheless, I would just suggest to you that what my, my student did here was a remarkable piece of work. Very simple, very methodical. Uh, and when you find a relationship that's as consistent as that one, chances are you found something which is significant. And what it tells you uh, is that there is, and it's clear which way the causality is going to run in this story, that external financial forces, George Soros, for example, um, just to take a, pick a name out of the air, uh, who have an effect on a country's exchange rate, whether, you know, whether this is a speculative operation or something that's based upon trade imbalances, doesn't matter that that is going to have a direct effect on industrial pay inequality. And we already know that industrial pay inequality is very closely associated with household income inequality. So the causal lines are clear. It must be coming from the external financial sector to the industrial sector and therefore to the households which earn industrial income, essentially. Uh, and those are the households which have the most active role in determining the structure of the overall inequality of incomes. Why is this important? Well, from the standpoint of economic argument, it's important uh, in part because it interjects an element into the um, argument which has been overwhelmingly neglected in the literature. Uh, and fundamentally, uh, the economic literature, which has been focused on the developed countries, has, um, uh, I think obsessed is not too strong a word, over the years uh, about the uh, consequences of technological change and education on inequality. The idea being that employers have uh, come to demand uh, a greater degree of skill uh, this is distorted, if you like, the labor markets. The phrase that economists use is called skill bias technological change. Uh, and that the way to overcome this increase of inequality is for people to get out and get themselves more education, increase their skills. With the irony, of course, that everybody did that, then the premium would go down and nobody would be any further ahead. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a rather nasty little story, which has one implication that nobody's to blame for inequality except the workers who don't uh, keep up their skills. Uh, uh, but the second piece of it being that if they all did keep up their skills, then they wouldn't get any benefit from having done so. Uh, and against that, an argument uh, which I think has a stronger foundation uh, in the real world, but uh, which attributes the rise of inequality to increasing trade. But the problem with that uh, is that uh, it uh, is fundamentally an issue of comparing flows, uh, physical flows of exports and imports to a price, which is the relative wages. Uh, and that's not nearly as straightforward a thing as comparing a price to a price, the foreign exchange rate to the wage rates. 
And the foreign exchange rates have a direct impact on what people earn. It's the other thing is, a, is an indirect and behavioral argument which might or might not uh, have a role. Uh, and the uh, third problem is that uh, this story, which is, uh, or this debate, which is largely centered on the United States and other industrial, rich industrial countries, really tells you very little about what's happening in the rest of the world. Whereas what we uh, uh, have, I think, been able to establish is that there is for almost the whole world, with the exception perhaps of the United States, a common story of very basic importance. And it's a story which roots the uh, fate of the populations of most countries in forces that lie outside those countries and that operate at the global level. Basically the forces of financial instability, of financial governance, and financial power. <coughs> Questions that are settled in places like New York and Washington and not in national capitals. issue that one has to then ask um, or raise is whether it matters. We may all feel a certain ethical tug uh, when we're told that inequality is being driven up by forces outside the control of uh, some nation, but you ask the question, does it make a difference? Or do those countries work better or less well if their inequality levels change. Um, and that's a question which one can uh, answer, allowing uh, that in certain countries having, as I said earlier, very high levels of inequality due to technical dynamism is not necessarily a bad thing. But we are able to establish some relationships. One is that in general, countries which have less inequality in their pay structures tend to have less unemployment, which is actually the opposite of uh, many textbook models. But the um, intuition is not uh, unreasonable. Countries which are highly unequal, there tend to be a lot of bad jobs and a small number of good ones. And what do people do? They leave the bad jobs to go get a good one. And there are more people looking for jobs than there are jobs. And so there's unemployment. If you think about China, where maybe 140 million people leave the countryside to look for construction and other jobs in the city, a great many of them are unemployed at any given time. There's the difference between the pay. But it's worth it for them because the difference between the pay uh, that they can get if they land one of the better jobs is, uh, is very much, is very great compared to what they would face if they stayed in the villages. And this is a comprehensively true story. It, uh, it motivates migration to Europe. It motivated migration from up the Mississippi Valley uh, to uh, the Midwest of the United States in the 40s and 50s. It's a substantial, uh, really, um, I mean, unquestionably correct uh, economic force. Uh, a second reason why inequality uh, tends to be associated with weaker economic performance and control of inequality with stronger economic performance emerges from the experience of the Scandinavian countries, uh, beginning in the 30s really, but articulated most clearly in the early 1950s uh, by the trade unions in Sweden. And that is that if you control the difference between good and bad pay, compress the wage structure, you're basically putting pressure on your business sector to be more uh, better performing. You're saying businesses that pay low wages just simply can't get away with it, and they're going to either have to close down, or move, or improve. Uh, and at the same time, you're also saying that businesses which are at the front of the technological uh, um, scheme of things are going to be, find a favorable environment, and so over time the productivity levels will improve. And I think there's, that's a very major part of the reason why uh, Sweden in particular which was not a rich country in 1930, became one of the richest countries in the world by the end of the century. It simply was a, attracted high-end industries and, and, and was unfavorable to the low-end ones. And then there's a third reason, which emerges pretty strongly uh, from the work that we're doing, uh, which is to look at 
what rising inequality tells you uh, about, uh, about the dynamics of economic um, development. <clears throat> and I uh, offer an analogy which I imagine will not be unfamiliar uh, to you, which is uh, uh, that uh, economic inequality seems to have a lot of the same properties as blood pressure. Now, your doctor will tell you that there is a range of human blood pressure, which is reasonable. But that within that range, it's better to be at the low end than at the high end. Right. And controlling blood pressure is a good thing to do. Same time, if you're below that range, that has consequences. Sluggishness, if you like. Uh, the zero blood pressure, analogous to perfect equality, is something you find only in the morgue. <laughs> uh, and the other thing is that when blood pressure rises and when inequality rises, you may not have a symptom. You may, in fact, it may be living very well, too well. Uh, but that's a sign you're heading for trouble. And you see this in the American data very clearly, that as inequality rises toward a peak in 2000, we head toward the crash of the NASDAQ. As it rises again toward another peak in 2007, we head toward the great financial crisis, the crash of the mortgage-backed uh, securities markets. And it's been rising to another peak uh, basically since 2010. Uh, and who knows what that will entail for us going forward. Uh, so what can be done? The argument that I would uh, make is that for most countries of the world, the most important thing, and I'll put up a slide just to give credit to my students, uh, the most important thing is to have a uh, better system of um, regulated global finance. That if that is not uh, achieved, then progress toward reducing inequality, which has been uh, uh, evident around the world, actually, for the last 15 years, uh, can be wiped out very quickly. And the uh, collapse of, or the decline in exchange rates, the depreciations that you've seen all across Latin America and other parts of the world in the last year have been very substantial. Uh, and they are associated with rising inequality. Well, that will be seen in the data very soon. Uh, and also with a, um, uh, a turn toward uh, uh, much more conservative right-wing governments that will be reversing the social progress that was made in Brazil, in Argentina, uh, and in other countries uh, over the past uh, 15 years. So that's, that, that becomes a very fundamental question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I guess two-part question. One is uh, how do you measure changes in international global finance, the movements of capital, I guess, is what you're talking about. I'm not sure. Well, the, the uh, instability of exchange rates are going to give an indicator of what, what the financial flows have been. But getting a direct measure of the flows is another issue. And yeah. how do you control it? I mean, what, how do you control means, that? Are there means to influence it? Well, there are ways, of course. Uh, the countries that have done this most successfully over the years uh, are those that had maintained a degree of capital control. Uh, that was true of China up until, well, it's still true nominally of China, although they've been uh, so relaxed at this point that practically anything goes. But when I was advising the government of China, one of the things I advised them was do not relax capital controls. Uh, that was in the middle 1990s, and that saved them, I think, helped save them from uh, the Asian crisis in 1997. They basically were not affected by it. The government of India also, up until the early 90s um, and, and beyond, has maintained a degree of capital control. It's easier for large countries to do than for small ones. Small ones have to band together and create some kind of stabilizing financial framework, uh, which can uh, give them a, some sense of common front to the rest of the world. Uh, and the question of the possibility of that depends upon whether the large countries and the rich ones, and particularly the United States and the United Kingdom, the financial centers, uh, are willing uh, to accept that this is a legitimate policy goal. We did in the 1940s. Uh, Roosevelt's good neighbor policy was, a, was an acceptance of that there were limits on the power of global finance. Uh, but if the U.S. government continues to be run by its financiers, then uh, it's, that's, that's a hard uh, uh, road to hoe. Right. 
So that would be my 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 projection for the for the world. For the United States, I, I'm I'm firmly in the Sanders camp. Uh, and in fact, I was an advisor to the Sanders campaign. I've been a. Uh, and I think they, that there are things that we could do that would have direct effect and that we have the uh, liberty and power to do because we are the center of the global financial system. We can raise minimum wages. We can strengthen unions. We can strengthen social insurance. Uh, we can increase the progressivity of our tax system. Uh, um, we can go after tax havens. Uh, and we can close down the ones that are particularly the ones that are uh, onshore in the United States, Nevada, Delaware, and so forth, which have, uh, where the, yeah, go ahead. Do you have a suggestion for addressing corporate governance? Why the people at the top of an organization mm -hmm. make two, three, five, six hundred times what the person at the low end of the spectrum? It, that's a, it's, a very, it's a very important point, and the main reason why that's the case is that we've moved to a model of re, of, of, uh, of paying chief executives with, uh, with, with stock options uh, and uh, other forms of capital gain so that this comes at the expense of the investor rather than largely from the corporate cash flow directly in most cases. Uh, and that uh, has, a, a, has a, a disastrous effect on the incentives that chief executives have. And basically, they are, uh, they are stock market valuation maximizers rather than uh, executives of a going concern. And the reason why you don't see that in Japan is precisely because it didn't happen there. Uh, whereas uh, we've, we've, we've tied the corporation. This was a, an idea uh, that emerged in part from, well, I won't say it emerged from economists, but certainly when, when, the, uh, when the CEOs decided it was to their advantage, there were economists available to tell them, tell the world that it would be a good thing. But we're, I think it's clear that what it, the effect of that over decades has been to turn going concerns into shells, uh, which are easily manipulated for the benefit of the CEO. That's a problem. And I want to just, if I just wrap up and then we'll come to questions momentarily. The, the one other thing I would add is that in a society like ours, accumulations are inevitable. And we shouldn't be opposed to that. There are going to be some people who will do very, very well. Uh, and that's part of the incentive structure. But we have had for a century a system, a pretty good system, invented by Teddy Roosevelt, uh, to encourage wealthy people uh, to uh, recycle those accumulations before they uh, pass on to the grim reader, reaper. And that's called the estate tax, the estate and gift tax. And a well-functioning estate and gift tax with a high rate and a decent exemption and uh, a, a control over all the loopholes, which now make it into much less effective thing than it should be, has the effect of persuading uh, wealthy people to be part of their community and to uh, put their wealth to work without having it to co go back through uh, uh, the government. Uh, and as I think we can observe in practically all of our institutions of higher education and all of our our health care institutions, it's a good thing to have multiple sources of finance for these institutions that gives them more stability than they would have if they were entirely dependent upon a state legislature or a federal budget. Uh, and it's a good thing uh, in a social sense because, as I say, it brings the wealthy citizens into the community and creates a kind of, uh, of common uh, sense of purpose that uh, is largely absent in many other countries that do not have this system. So I think we should be much more aggressive in defending and strengthening that system, which has been under savage attack in recent years. Um, and um, the other advantage of doing that is that you avoid political dynasties, uh, which is what happens. The wealthy, uh, wealthy families, their children do not uh, go on to, to create more, or to do more accumulation or create more wealth. Well, okay, we have the case of Donald Trump. Uh, it's not clear whether he accumulated anything, to, to what extent he did. But what they do do, and Trump is an example, is they go into, they go into politics. Uh, and we end up with the political class, uh, which is entirely uh, or dominated or by the spoiled children of ultra-rich people. Uh, and that is something which we ought to be seriously addressing for the benefit of all future generations. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>
two very impolite requests. One, if you have any comment about the speech you heard, please write it to us. You have our email, so we can share it with everybody else. Second impolite request is, please, please make your question as quick and brief, as short as possible, so everybody else has a chance to hear the answer. Yes, sir. Uh, it, it appears that the Nordic countries picked the right horses. What were those horses that they picked? Say again? The Nordic countries uh, in your last yeah. map were the only ones that seemed to have any degree of equality. Uh, and, and, and you said that it came from their choices. I think the way to think about this, the Nordic countries are very open to the world. They do not engage in trade protection. But what they do have are very strong trade unions, very strong. Uh, they, the Swedish LO has uh, coverage of about 90% of the labor force uh, and very, therefore very um, basically centralized uh, determination of the earning structure. So that's always been the, the, the advantage that the Nordic countries have had. Um, I think it's fair to say even in the most recent data you see substantial increases in inequality even in Sweden. Um, and you see big trouble in Finland, which has been tied into the euro uh, and may well be, in my view, the first country to break out. Uh, the, uh, but, uh, um, but over this period, the, the basic story that I'm telling holds true. That, uh, and Norway, of course, had the advantage of an enormous amount of oil, which it has managed in such a way as to provide a very strong egalitarian foundation that the Norwegian welfare state is uh, extraordinarily robust. So it's, it's, it's the effect of having strong internal institutions that are able to resist, if you like, the waves of, of external forces that have affected those countries as much as, every, as all the others. Is that from governance? Uh, it's part of, of the, if you like, the political compromise that created um, the, the Scandinavian system that created it, if you like, you know, 70 or 80 years ago. Uh, that has been developed ever since and to gotten weaker in some cases, in some respects, um, and had it, it's definitely had its difficulties, but it is a governance question, yes. Yeah. Sir. The, you've started to reach onto this question of inequality and mm -hmm. financialization. And I'm sure that the financialization, you might want to just familiarize people with it, but it's the job, uh, it's Apple with Job and Cook and how they're handled, and how an airline today makes more money on its investments and its hedging on fuel than it does on selling seats. In other words, it's that 4% or 5% that's producing 25% of the corporate profits in the country financialization, and would you address inequality and financialization? Yeah. Uh, the, uh, well, I think one of the things, the, the, the broad picture I, I, I was showing illustrates is that financialization drives inequality everywhere. In the United States, uh, one can see, I mean, another way to look at the, at the data, one can see uh, the relationship between uh, asset prices and, uh, and inequality as measured, particularly in tax records, which pick up uh, the fluctuations of incomes at the top. Uh, and that's a very close and strong relationship. Now, to give you one uh, example, if you look at the, uh, you can calculate the inequality measure across counties in the United States. Uh, and if you uh, take out five counties from the data from the early 1990s to 2000, the increase in inequality goes down by half. Uh, the five counties that you remove, and 3,150 counties, and half of the rise is due to five. What are they? Well, one of them is, n no, no surprise, New York, New York. All right? All right? And the other four are... Santa Clara, San Mateo, and San Francisco counties in Northern California, and King County, Washington. So this is entirely driven by the financial sector and the tech sector. Right? Now they take out 15 counties, the entire rise goes away. Nothing's happening in the rest of the country. 
right? what's happening is happening in, 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 in very small enclaves where people's incomes are being driven to stratospheric heights by uh, the effect of financial flows. And if you look at the, at, the, at the period up to the crisis in 2007, you can pick out the counties with the biggest speculative building booms. They're, they're scattered more over the, there's, there's in Florida and Nevada and Southern California and so forth. Uh, but it's clear that, that these phenomena are driving the fluctuation of incomes. Yeah. Yeah. Assuming that it's a good thing to have less inequality in a country, um, you suggested that a lot of the inequality um, comes from outside the country one way or another. But should countries, for example, have um, steeper progressive taxation? Or should countries have even more rigorous um, um, well, uh, what am I trying to say? Uh, have controls of the maximum wage that can be given. As I understand it, for example, some countries uh, control the level of income from lowest to highest, so that the highest can't be higher than some fraction of the lowest, I mean some multiplier of the lowest. Are there such are there such things? I'm, I, I'm, I'm not aware uh, of any place where that is done explicitly. Um, I thought I was, when I proposed it for American corporations in a book in 1998, I thought I was being pretty far out. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, um, let me just get to the problem of, of, of progressive taxation. Uh, first of all, in many countries, there is no such thing as income accounting. So, and the, or income taxation at all. So the idea of making it progressive is moot. Uh, and secondly, in many countries where there is income taxation, it's relatively easy uh, to um, uh, run for people at the top to run their incomes outside the country uh, and therefore not to be subject. That's, of course, what they do. Uh, the scale at which uh, this is happening in the world has only recently, I think, become clear to people. I highly recommend the, uh, the book by the, the two Obermeyers of the Süddeutsche Zeitung uh, on the Panama Papers uh, and give you a sense to the extent to which uh, people were, uh, uh, the, the elites of a whole, of practically every country you might choose to investigate are, uh, are, are taking advantage of, of these kinds of shell corporations. Um, so this is a, a, a problem which has to be dealt with at some global level, in my view. Uh, yes, a country can, France, can in, impose a higher uh, progressive tax rate, and that was a, a feature of the, uh, of, of the um, Hollande administration, uh, which somehow didn't bring him uh, much in the way of popularity. Uh, and Gérard Depardieu went off to Brussels. Uh, you know, I imagine that they, were, that they got some increased revenue because France is a large country, but it is a country with Luxembourg right on its border and Switzerland right on its border. And the, 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 uh, the, the trains run to those places and people know how to, how to get there. Uh, yeah. Uh, we talked a little bit about Piketty. You mentioned him. Your yeah. presentation is mainly on earned, what I would call earned income in the broad sense. Uh, can you comment just for a moment or two on the effect of capital on inequality? I mean, Piketty's thesis is that the return on capital is much, much higher historically than the return on labor. Can you uh, just comment on how? I yeah, I, 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 I did a, a rev one of the first reviews of, of Piketty's capital in the 21st century. And, uh, I found uh, basically three things about it that I did not like. One was the theory, uh, the second was the empirical work, and the third was the policy ideas. So, uh, uh, the, but just taking the, 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 the theoretical uh, 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 element here, Piketty has a single idea, which is that 
the income of the top most people is driven by the interest rate uh, in relation to the growth rate of the economy. Uh, and the reality is that while that is a perfectly reasonable way of thinking about the 19th century, it's not a reasonable way of thinking about the 20th century. In the 20th century, we have a very substantial ability uh, to tax, uh, so reducing the post-tax uh, uh, return on capital, uh, and a uh, very substantial ability, to, well, to keep the interest rate actually under control. It was not, it's not no longer set uh, in an uh, open market. It's either the underlying cost of funds to banks is set by, by Janet Yellen every six weeks at the Open Market Committee. Uh, so it's an administered rate. Uh, and there are other reasons that in the 20th century also, I mean, uh, there is a, a standard diagram in Piketty's work, which everybody uses, which shows inequality very high up until 1929. It comes down in the 1940s uh, and stays low until the early 1980s and then jumps up and goes up after that. Well, it would not be reasonable to conclude from that graph that inequality today is similar to what it was in 1929 simply not the case. In 1929, there was no Social Security. There was no uh, health, uh, public health insurance. There was no uh, unemployment uh, insurance. There was no uh, deposit insurance. Uh, there was no nutrition assistance. There, was no, there were no 30-year mortgages. There were um, uh, the entire structure that created the American middle class didn't exist. And we were a nation of renters and tenements by and large, with a few people uh, who, the Vanderbilts and the, uh, um, and, and the Goulds and so forth, who were the Rockefellers and the Carnegies, who, uh, who, who palled around together at Newport and, 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 and went bride shopping in, uh, uh, on the French Riviera. Right? And that is uh, a very different world from the one which the 20th century created. My view uh, is that Piketty's notion that we are in, in some in necessary process returning to the, uh, to the, to the 19th century's pattern of distribution is uh, uh, out of touch in some sense with, with the way the, the world actually has the been constructed. Return on capital broadly defined, not, what? Just on, not, not just the interest rate on bonds, on government bonds, which he focuses on in yep. the past, but he defines capital as land and real estate and all, all the other assets that can produce wealth or, or uh, so I'm, I'm just getting Yeah, uh, are, and are there's. Are you saying that capital is not a major factor in the inequality? Oh, it is. Oh, there's no question in the American case it is. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, and we collect the data pretty accurately, but the, uh, the, the argument that Piketty makes, which is about some inevitability and the return to capital being higher, uh, then the then the growth rate strikes me as being, uh, first of all, improb un unsupported by his own data, improbable on a priori grounds, and easily compensated for by social institutions, including taxes uh, and, and 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 social insurance, which can assure that even if it were the case that you didn't get the pattern of increasing concentration that Piketty thinks is intrinsic to the system. My view is that the, we worked out how to stabilize uh, a capitalist system with countervailing institutions, to take a phrase from my father, countervailing power. And we should, we should pursue that, um, that line until uh, we're satisfied with the result. I do agree that there is a tendency, I mean, I'm, and I'm enough of a Georgist to believe uh, that there is a tendency for capital to concentrate in the value of land, to be capitalized into the value of land, and the right solution for that is to tax it, mm -hmm. right? to tax the land values. Yeah. Then you get a so more productive. So if you don't tax capital, you get a problem. If you do tax capital, you solve the problem. I'm oversimplifying. Right, it. right. But, it, but in particular, you need to tax those forms of capital which can't be moved. Mm -hmm. And land, because land does capitalize t uh, uh, capital values and cannot be moved, a proper taxation system focused on land uh, has a lot of advantages. Uh, an interesting, uh, I mean, obviously it's constitutionally banned in places like Texas to have a state property tax. Why? Because the landowners wrote the Constitution. That's pretty clear. Uh, 
uh, I, I could go on to talk a little bit about how things work in China, which has not had the landlordism problem since 1949 when they <coughs> basically abolished it. And the result of that is that the governments, which collect rents directly, have a lot of revenue. This is why Chinese municipalities are as wealthy and develop as quickly as they have. Yeah. Since you were an advisor to the Bernie Sanders campaign, I'd be very interested to know your feelings about his proposal for free tuition at public institutions of higher education. Something you don't hear too much about, I think, is the impact that that could have upon small private colleges, really right even here in Vermont, where there we have about 10 or 12 very small private colleges, and if they had to compete against free tuition at public institutions, it could put them out of business, I think. But I wonder, just as a tool for <coughs> mitigating inequality, if you feel that that proposal really has merit. Um, well, that's a good question. The, uh, and I, since I teach at a uh, public university, uh, I, I can see some of the difficulties of it. Uh, there were, in addition to the one you mentioned, uh, issues were raised almost immediately by the uh, historically black colleges uh, who are uh, uh, right. similar, similar effect. Uh, and I think there's an issue uh, with uh, applying a model which I suspect developed from a view that the public universities serve the working class, which is generally speaking the historically truth that is historically the case in the Northeast, uh, to the regions of the country, like the South, where the public universities serve the upper class. Uh, and so uh, the University of Texas we, is, is not the same sort of entity uh, as the uh, University of Massachusetts at Amherst is, or University of Massachusetts at Boston. Uh, and so I think, uh, actually, while the, it, the Sanders got at an important problem, uh, which is the problem of, 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 of student debt uh, and, and, and the spiraling cost of higher education, uh, working out a workable uh, program given the institutional structures that you have to allow for, was not something that was achieved during the campaign, in my view. That would be, that's when you turn it over to, to, the, to, uh, to, to staff uh, to figure out how you actually draft a bill, then you're going you're gonna to have a lot of, of these problems that would have to be dealt with. But you know, the University of Texas, is, you would not want to give it a guarantee of its cost structure. I mean, after all, many of these universities have a large, uh, are basically small uh, uh, educational functions attached to a vast uh, department of athletics. I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, one has to be careful what you're dealing with. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, so, I was wondering if you're familiar with a book. Uh, it's by two British researchers. It's called The Spirit Level One. Oh, sure. I know them both very well. Um, so uh, I was very impressed by that book. Uh, the basic premise of the book for the audience mm -hmm. is that uh, inequality weakens the social fabric of a society and that the social ills ranging from depression, alcoholism, teenage pregnancy, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. uh, emanate uh, or go up as inequality goes up. So I was wondering if you could comment, number one, do you agree that as societies become more equal, uh, the you know, social ills do in fact increase? And number two, uh, if you see any of that at play currently as the undercurrent of what's happening in America today and you know, the, the election, why it's so heated and so... Uh, Okay. Um, I, as I said, I, I know uh, both, um, uh, uh, yeah, and Richard Wilkinson quite well. Um, the original work on which the argument was based was epidemiological work uh, in organizations, uh, bureaucracies, which showed no surprise that stress levels go up as you go down the, the pecking order and people are more put upon if they're at the bottom there than at the top. Uh, and uh, that it was a, a very interesting and important thing to document. Um, I have to say that 
I, I worry about the categories uh, that are assumed to be the operational categories in the empirical work here, where we're looking at health outcomes and uh, 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 mortality rates and life expectancies and a whole range of, of social indicators, and assuming that, uh, that the, the observational unit, the appropriate one, is the country. I don't know whether that's correct or not. It might be the city. It might be a larger region. It, might, it, it could be any number of things. It might be a particular ethnic group within a city that is the appropriate frame of reference for individual people. Uh, and so I'm, 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 uh, I worry about the ability of that statistical work, all those lovely graphs with, with nice lines that all, all go in the same direction, to hold up to a, uh, uh, a challenge from a skeptical researcher. And there have been some challenges which suggest that, they, that, that, uh, that if they'd included other countries that things might have fallen off the line and uh, that other ways of looking at it would not give you quite such clean answers. Uh, and so that's, that's, I do have a certain amount of reservation about, uh, about buying into the, the, the very categorical argument. But I think broadly, of course, it's correct. Um, it, it, it's, it's clear that within the right framework, if you can find the right framework for individual people, uh, that where they are in a, in, 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 a, in, a, in a hierarchy or in a, a social order is obviously going to affect a great many things about their, about their physical well-being and their psychological well-being. So that's correct. And uh, is this driving the American uh, uh, phenomenon? I have, I, I, again, I, I, that goes over my pay grade as far as being be able to give you a, uh, a, 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 a categorical answer. I, if I, uh, what, if I think, if I really understood what was happening in the United States right now, I think I would be looking for a retirement home in Costa Rica. <laughs> not discounted, but set aside wealth-based in income, saying countervailing value yeah. or forces are coming play. And yet at the same time, you've identified how people with a lot of wealth are able to move that wealth out of the system right. or have the political power to prevent that what the countervailing uh, yeah. forces from coming into play. So on one hand, you seem to be saying, well, don't worry about wealth income. Oh, no, no, I, I, I... Mitigate it. But on the other hand... <laughs> I mean, I think it, it's, it, one can say categorically that wealth income is important everywhere. However, it is not equally well measured everywhere. All right? In the United States, we do a pretty good job compared to most other countries. We have a terrifying tax agency called the Internal Revenue Service. I, I suppose most of you are familiar with it. Uh, and uh, people, by and large, not everybody, but people, by and large, report their income, right? So in a great many countries that are wealthy, uh, that's not the, the habit. And in a great many countries that, are, uh, that have many rich people, there's no requirement at all. So when you're trying to make a comparison of the US to other countries, you have to take account of the fact that one of the reasons wealth is a bigger piece of the reported income in the United States is that we do a better job of capturing it in our data. Uh, and that, in fact, does show, in, uh, there, there are some very, very clear uh, uh, indices of that being, being the case. There is a tendency to look at our data and say, because we show high, report a bigger number, a higher inequality number, it means we're a more unequal society than, let's say, France or Italy. I don't buy it for a minute. Uh, I think that the, uh, uh, that, to, I mean, there, there's, it defies common sense uh, to believe that uh, and uh, defies the experience one has <laughs> you know, living in uh, these places. Uh, and uh, that is in part because, as I say, we do a better job of measuring here uh, than, let's say, the Italians, the Italians do. We're more preoccupied with it. My, my wife, who comes from China, thinks that the United Americans are obsessed with inequality. Uh, so, um, 
Yeah. 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 Sir. Yeah, for purposes of discussion, accepting your notion that um, the, the reforms of the New Deal and after that mm -hmm. is a means of assuaging inequality generally. Um, speaking more as a political economist mm -hmm. rather than an economist, how would you address politically and culturally what many of us, including yourself, have noticed to be deep-seated profound opposition to this kind of uh, reform deeply embedded in American society? You know, I think we have to build an argument based upon uh, the historical achievements uh, that are distinctive to American society. Uh, at, you know, the New Deal, the Great Society, were transformative moments and very specific things were done that basically created the larger middle class of which most of us are basically part, uh, which didn't exist there before. Um, and uh, so I think it is a question of uh, reminding ourselves that uh, we do have, we have competing traditions. We have a Gilded Age tradition. We have an oligarchical tradition. Those forces are there. And for a period from the 1980s through the end of the, of the century, they had an ideological dominance. But they clearly showed that they can't run the country. Uh, and that leaving things in their hands is a formula for disaster. Uh, I firmly believe that we cannot afford the financial system that we have. It is a dead weight cost on economic activity and drains uh, the resources that should be spread out over a much larger number of much smaller units uh, of different kinds of, 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 ec of economic activity. Right? And that means we have to deconcentrate the wealth and power. I don't think we make that argument, uh, we'd see a widespread agreement with it. I mean, that was what Bernie Sanders actually discovered, was that if a political leader with a sufficient amount of energy and discipline makes the case that there is a broad acceptance of it in the country. So I'm in favor of, of, of pursuing that, that, that political line. I really admired Sanders for his ability to give a small number of clear-cut points, which then could be absorbed essentially by very, very large audiences. It wasn't constantly shifting his ground. In fact, he didn't shift it at all. Uh, he knew what he wanted to say, and he said it, and he said it repeatedly. Uh, and that turned out to, uh, to really show the reach of those ideas, which was reassuring because it suggested to me that there still is a country out there which I recognize as having some of the values that I was brought up with. So I think that's, it's not a, it's not a hopeless, it's not a hopeless struggle. Well, some of us would love to stay here until midnight and <laughs> ask more questions. Mm -hmm. But uh, our speaker has not had his dinner yet. Oh. And I have oh, to take him out for dinner. So oh if there are no more questions, I thank you very much for well, coming. Thank you all. I